from the anti Semitic state to the right. state. Normally, you. But I don't see a problem there. I mean, maybe, maybe I could see more of this if that's other terrible. Yeah, but. Yeah. I just say it doesn't matter. Yes. Welcome back, everybody. Our next speaker, Simon Saunders, very well known author of physics from Oxford University. Title of his talk. Ontology and invariant predication. Yes. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Fred, and, and thank you, everyone. It's an honor to be here. I put up this photograph with Fred because he's so magnificently photogenic. <laughs> <laughs> um, in contrast to this one, <laughs> it's really terribly photogenic. Um, so there you are. Uh, I'll, I think Aristotle there is appropriate for quite a bit of my talk, um, but towards the end we'll see a different figure. Uh, so I, I want to begin with what I'm thinking of, trying to give it a name, really, thudding disagreements, um, which I've been familiar with uh, over the years, um, especially the first and the third, um, but I got a new one last night from, from Fred Fred, that's also why your photograph was up. So what is a thudding disagreement? Well, it's the one where either somebody sort of falls down um, because they've been proven wrong or because they start shouting around in front of the table or perhaps their jaw just drops with amazement that someone could say such a thing. Mm. We've all had the experience of it, and they're of an interesting character, these uh, thudding disagreements. Anyway, I'm just giving you um, uh, three examples. Uh, the second and third are relevant to my talk, but the first one isn't particularly, but it is enormously relevant to my work. So there are those who claim that Nelson's stochastic dynamics or continuous spontaneous localization or pilot wave theory component and so forth is are empirically adequate part of physics. Now if that was true, um, for me anyway, uh, there would be no more point in the Everett interpretation uh, and uh, I would embrace whichever of these worked with in particular like many of the United States. Although I do find it rather elegant, I would hope to find elegance in some such solution, but I do not believe these claims. I do not believe there is any empirical adequacy. I do not believe there is a single model of a relativistic interacting quantum field theory in either Bohmian terms or CSL terms or Nelson stochastic dynamics terms that actually delivers. And what I mean by delivers is that insofar as these three approaches all have a very explicit, very precisely defined ontology, whether it be an evolving field configuration stochastically or deterministically, or uh, be it evolving particle trajectories, um, I do not believe any of those work in the relativistic domain. Uh, and the challenge is a very simple one. Uh, give me a precise model, tell me precisely how a field configuration evolves over time, for example, so that it clusters, clumps up into localized stuff. Show me how that happens, the sort of thing that Einstein spent the last 30 years of his life trying to discern in the equations, nonlinear equations of general relativity. So show me, tell me how that goes. Uh, if, of course, you stick in localized entities right at the beginning as particles and non-relativistic versions of pilot wave theory, that would be fine. Then how are you going to deal with air creation and annihilation events and so on and so forth? Uh, and you know, it's a long story. And yes, you might go for the Dirac uh, negative energy C, which is a way of, I mean, you've got an infinite number of particles, but you're looking at the holes in the C as antiparticles and so on and so forth. So there may be ways of doing it, but I don't believe they've been done. And I think that for those who maintain that it's been done, but it hasn't been done, it's almost as bad as Everettians who maintain that there's no problem of probability uh, and don't actually try to articulate a solution to the problem of probability, which we Everettians have spent the last 15 or 20 years doing in enormous detail. That doesn't mean we've won the day. I'm just saying we take the problem seriously. Okay, so now the second one on the list, are mathematical theories of physics easily reproduced? You'll see why uh, this will become relevant to my talk in a few slides. Um, but again, I don't think that uh, anything like this is possible or has been done to date, not even with the most trivial branch of physics. Well, I can imagine you can do it with compass and rule constructions in Euclidean geometry. You can actually utilize that in a reasonably set threading sense. And you can probably do it with something like linear optics. You know, it's possible, conceivable. 
but I don't think for any significant portion of mathematical physics has it been done. Um, and I, I realized that, Fred in particular, I realize this is controversial between us, so I'm not assuming that I'm right here, um, and I would welcome comments from the audience. Uh, but the last one is in a way the most interesting uh, for my talk, um, and let's begin right away with the uh, Locus Classicus of it. Um, so Bass, uh, you know, uh, uh, fairly beloved, admired, uh, but also infuriating figure in philosophy of science. Um, so here's what he said at the one point where he engaged uh, with Quine, although he didn't name Quine. Um, as far as I know, Bass never engaged with Quine, except for a paper, one paper that he wrote, I think it was the Perspectives on Quine, which was on naturalized epistemology, and which did not focus on the relevant part of naturalized epistemology, or not the one that I'm trying to emphasize. So, uh, this is in uh, Sunday Big Image, it's the beginning of chapter four. <coughs> I hope you've all seen it, read it, thought about it, and said, this is very important. So to read, um, I, I've got to you know, look. At this point, it may be objected that I have drawn an, uh, an, an arbitrary line. Surely the observable objects and processes we recognize in our world are also postulated entities, believed in because they best explain and systematize the sense experience or series of sense data, which are at bottom the only real evidence we have. Sorry, another typo here. Um, should I not be as unwilling to postulate tables and trees as forces, fields, and absolute space, unless I have a rationale that shows them to be essentially different in some relevant way? Okay. I mentioned, uh, sorry, so many typos. I mention this objection because I have heard it, but it astonishes me, since philosophers spent the first five decades of this century refuting the presuppositions that lie behind it. Indeed, every school of thought in Western philosophy, continental as well as Anglo-Saxon, refuted them in its own terms. Well, here's one school of thought. <clears throat> this is from uh, Posits and Reality, which is a very short piece by Quine. It was intended as the beginning of his work and object. Um, uh, but for reasons that I don't understand or know, uh, he dismissed, he didn't use it, he wrote another in the beginning, uh, but published it separately in, in uh, 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 his collection on paradoxes. <coughs> so, um, I, I do recommend, those of you who are not Quinians, I do recommend that you read it because it contains almost the whole of this philosophy. It's only five pages. So, sense data are posits too. Okay, so in no sense presume. Uh, they are posits of psychological theory, but not on that account, unreal. The sense station may be construed as a hypothetical component. This is the most clunky left sentence I've ever seen quite right. The sense station may be construed as a hypothetical component of subjective experience standing in closest possible correspondence to the experimentally measurable conditions of physical stimulation of the end organs. Okay. Now, do they exist? Don't they exist? Uh, I won't ask for a show of hands. But, um, uh, uh, let's just see a little bit more what he had to say. Sense data, if they are to be posited at all, are evidentially fundamental. Every man is beholden to his senses for every hint of bodies. The physical particles are naturally fundamental in this kind of way. Laws of behavior of those particles afford, so far as we know, the simplest formulation of a general theory of what happens. Back to that in a moment. So back to Bass. <clears throat> this followed on immediately from the previous quote. So it is easy for me to add at least this: such events as experiences and such entities as sense data, when they are not already understood in the framework of observable phenomena ordinarily recognized, are theoretical entities. They are, what is worse, the theoretical entities of an armchair psychology that cannot rightfully claim to be scientific. I wish merely to be agnostic about the existence of the unobservable aspects of the world described by science, but sense data, I am sure, do not exist. Okay, so uh, I hope you'll agree um, with a thumping disagreement, a thudding disagreement. <coughs> um, if we go back to Quine, um, this is what he said about common sense bodies. He says they are conceptually fundamental. It is by reference to them that the very notions of reality and evidence are acquired, and that the concepts which have to do with physical particles, or even with sense data, tend to be uh, framed and phrased. Um, so, hang on, let me just see. Yeah. So, if you think of what Bass is saying here, 
when they are not already understood in the framework of observable phenomena ordinarily recognized. I think actually this fits uh, Bass's requirement. <coughs> uh, so common sense bodies indeed have this role um, of organizing sense data. Um, now, this is what I want to focus on. Why, why does any of this matter? It matters because um, there is a, a view of science, uh, which I've not seen much articulated, but I'm sure it exists. Um, and the view is this, that um, sent ordinary common sense bodies stand to sensory data stimuli roughly in the way that unobservable entities stand to experimental data. In other words, uh, and to speak about the unobservables, they are used to organize experimental data. So, for example, consider the experimental data of chemistry. They are organized by atomic and molecular physics. <coughs> um, atomic and molecular physics itself is organized by interactions of neutrons and electrons. <coughs> um, the, the zoology of hadron physics is organized by quarks. Um, but it doesn't have to be so extravagant about this. Um, cellular structures um, organize uh, the metabolism and how we to understand all of the observable characteristics of metabolism. Um, I, I think this is the just across all of the sciences. <coughs> uh, so this organizational role um, is, I think, indispensable. Now, it's particularly indispensable when it comes to sense data, because as Lance, I think, is complaining against, so saying that you know, every philosophy has dismissed this, uh, and this is what's right about it, there is no autonomous language for sense data. And we just can't do it. Um, so the first place at which we've really got an autonomous language setting in is at the level of everyday objects. And it is by reference to them that we can communicate with each other and indeed organize our own perceptions. <coughs> So where is then the big difference that has to be so important for Bass? Presumably it's this. Because we can organize experimental data with reference to everyday bodies, that somehow that's good enough. And they don't need to be organized with respect to the microscopic or the unobservable. Okay, but, uh, so, so I think you know, in a way this is why and how Bass draws his line. And it would be impossible to draw the line at sensory data alone. Because, as I said, no autonomous language, no way of communicating with each other about our sensory data. <clears throat> but I, su I, su I, su I suggest to you that actually, in, in any special sciences, in, in physics, uh, it's very hard to organize experimental data without reference to the unobservables. This is the function that they have. This goes with another parallel that, insofar as the infant in first acquiring language and attempting to organize all this crazy cacophony of stimuli uh, and slowly acquiring concepts of objects um, is exploring a domain. And anyone who's got a kid knows exactly what this is about. A two-year-old is amazing. It's a sort of an exploring machine. And they just, you know, they go everywhere and they attempt everything that they can until they get too scared and go back to nothing or something like that. Um, and uh, the, the picture is this, that uh, in this way they learn and understand their environment learn how to operate within it, manipulate, and so forth. Um, scientists are likewise exploring an environment, exploring a domain, <coughs> uh, and much of that exploration is action. It's not just you know, contemplation of theory or something like that. One might think from philosophy of science that there's no more to science than you know, contemplating theories or speculating about alternative theories and, and then asking what could truth possibly mean. What is lacking in so much philosophy of science um, is uh, 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 attention to activity, actually. Just straight out, activity in the laboratory, use of theories to explore, acquiring data not for its own sake, but as leverage, as triangulation, as new ways of manipulation and control of a new environment. And every special science has its environment, has its domain. And so far as I know, every scientist I've ever spoken to about this who asked the question, I've been doing this for a few years now, uh, I ask them, yeah, how do you see this? They say, that's exactly what I think I'm doing. I'm exploring a domain. In cosmology, we see it very vividly. We're exploring the universe. <coughs> but it's the same virtually with every social science, and it's the same with fundamental physics. We're exploring a domain. We're attempting to. Of course, when you get to string theory, uh, we are so far now from action, from con control, from that it's a pure mathematical enterprise, and it may remain so. 
Anyway, so this is a very different picture of science. I don't think it would be more different from Bass's conception of science. And Bass could not more miss the point in suggesting that the goal of science is empirical adequacy. You know, the idea that what a child is attempting to do in exploring its domain is empirical adequacy with respect to the sensations that it requires um, is, well, <laughs> it's not the end. So there's my fudding disagreement. You see that come back here. It's a bit of a tough. Now, why does any of this matter? Well, <clears throat> if one wants to be a realist about uh, science and so forth, what does realism mean? Uh, I think it's just, I would present it as taking seriously this kind of exploration of the domain. Um, and I would take a seriously continuity with everyday objects, um, and that what is involved in um, articulating, describing, controlling the environment and, and so forth, is very you know, much part and parcel of it, is putting, uh, putting things into words. <clears throat> so it's articulating what exists in terms of words, not in terms of equations, um, that I think most scientists operate. Um, and uh, it seems to me it's the only way to get a continuity with questions with realism at the microscopic level or the super microscopic level, the logical level, with ordinary objects. And I think just as actually none of us is uh, agnostic about everyday objects. Certainly, Quine is not agnostic about everyday objects. Um, it's very hard to be agnostic about objects that are arrived at in the same way and talk of objects arrived at in the same way as everyday objects. Everyday objects is arrived at. So this, of course, brings up to mind. I mean, there's a couple of philosophers that come to mind here. One of them um, is uh, 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 so the, the natural ontological attitude of Arthur Fine. Um, we all recall his paper, uh, a uh, influential paper. He speaks about, in the same way as we speak of everyday things, we can be realists. Um, and another uh, philosopher that comes to mind is Ian Hacking, who more than any, I think, put great emphasis on interaction, on action, on intervening. Um, and his book, in a way, should have been a, a magnificent Orchid's classicus for this, but I think it's sort of disappointed. Um, I, I should go back to it and be clear on what, if anything, was disappointing about it. It certainly wasn't taken up, um, so that's, I think, regretted. So if um, you are with me at all so far, and of course there could be a structuralist form of description which is not what I'm advocating, as well as what I'm advocating, I'll come back to the right towards the end of the talk. Uh, but if you're with me that it's at least a part of what is involved in science and exploration as, and is in talking about the domains that we explore, putting into words, then you'll be sympathetic to the general project, but you might wonder, well, hasn't this always been the project of the logical positivists? You know, weren't they, after all, interested in putting into words, in their case, formal, regimented words, uh, symbolic logic, uh, physical theories. Is that not articulating a physical theory? Is it not reformulating it in words? Um, and the answer is I'm not proposing anything like that. <clears throat> okay. I'm also proposing, yes, I do have some use for regimentation, but I'm proposing a special way to link that regimentation, that use of words, to theories, not the one of reconstructing the theory in but the one of saying what there is in words, linking to theory, and linking like this, according to terms that are invariant under the symmetries of the theory concerned. And here by symmetries, I mean really mappings that lead to equations, motion, map solutions to solutions to equations. Um, so the idea is then, in the first instance, that sentences must be invariant under symmetries of the theory, as far as they express the model theory. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll come on to this in a moment. And one obvious way to achieve this, sentences should be constructed from invariant predicates. Okay. Uh, and lastly, that the domain of, it's one way of doing it, it's an obvious way of doing it, and the other is, last thing, the domain of quantification should be the smallest one possible, consistent with Leibniz's law. And this amounts to Closing the principle of identity and the sounds, the exhaustion of predicates. Okay, so where do the predicates come from? Um, so this links to 
uh, 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 an aspect that I've been trying to develop as a, as a philosophy. Um, but the, really where we begin with, in, in fundamental physics anyway, is with quantities. <coughs> um, and in the first instance, we can identify invariant quantities, and we can define predicates as invariant predicates uh, as ranges of values of those invariant quantities. So I see these predicates that we're using here um, because it's not an attempt to reconstruct the theory, uh, they could be just a coarse graining. You know, it's enough to give a coarse grained description of what there is. So take a range of values of some invariant physical quantity, uh, and that is the beginnings of a predicate of construction. Of course, what is its arity? We have to go much further. And of course, we leverage off and use as best we can what scientists are anyway saying that goes on with their theory, interpreting their theory, as all scientists do, better or worse. And actually, I don't have much to add to scientists are doing for better and worse, unless they're clearly in conflict with one another, or obviously muddled and confused, okay, but that can also happen, um, and uh, I think we've all of us had experience of talking to scientists where we learn a lot, but then we suddenly find that there's a, an area in which they're very unsure, which has been well worked over in philosophy of science, and where we actually have something to make the table. So I think there is something here that philosophers can do, and it's here that I see a point of regimentation, just in aiding precision. And then just to uh, uh, emphasize what this isn't, it has nothing to do with reconstructing the scientific theory as a body of mathematics and first technology. Absolutely no part of the project, of the goal, and so forth. And here I mean, like, reconstruction, what Russell and White had meant by reconstruction. <coughs> several volumes in order to reconstruct a very small fragments of uh, analysis. Uh, I mean what Quine meant by translation into the terms of set theory, which I think we could just more naturalize. He spoke of this great achievement of Russell and Whitehead, that we can translate, we really can translate mathematics into set theory. But this gains, uh, gains us nothing in confidence or uh, certainty of the axioms, because of course the axioms of the set theory is not obvious at all. Um, uh, and it's not what Hilbert proved in his Grundlag and their geometry, for example. So this was a great clarion call for logical positivism, works by people like Russell and Hilbert, uh, the axiomatization is the way forward for a genuine philosophical contribution to physical science, and it's a mathematical contribution to physical science. But what Hilbert actually provided was a kind of informal axiomatization. Um, many people have subsequently worked on his, uh, his axioms of geometry, people like Huntington, uh, people like Robertson, it's, it's been a long, long-going episode. I think what they may, might arrive at is, as I said right at the beginning, uh, an axiomatization purely in set theory of something like Euclidean constructions or the sorts of theorems delivered by Euclid. But I don't think it gives you anything, for example, in algebraic geometry that you can entirely different sort of construction in set theory. I grant Russell and Whitehead their claim, and Quine's claim, you can translate mathematics into set theory. Set theory is close to a formal logical uh, language. In this sense, you could actually construct physical theories in modern, in modern language than predicate calculus. It would be a vast and huge and unreadable and absolutely useless ent uh, enterprise for pedagogy or understanding. And it certainly wouldn't help to use Quine's dictum to be to be the value of a bound variable. Why not? Because the elements involved in these sets, you know. It, it, Goodness only knows what they would have to do with the physically real, as opposed to mathematical constructions that we're using to arrive at real actual numbers, or the real numbers. So, uh, so I hope I, I've sort of given, um, what's the word, um, uh, the right orientation for what I'm trying to do. <coughs> okay, so let's give some examples. Um, and I'll start with gravity and classical mechanics. Uh, this is the great Julian Barber. <coughs> Um, and he operated in a framework where, from my point of view, if I'm looking at invariant quantities of the symmetries of the theory, uh, they would be relative distances among particles at two different times. So a relative configuration of particles. I've got relative distances. I also have angles between lines connecting them as well. Um, and so you've got an instant snapshot at one time. Nothing but the point in the relative configuration space. You've got another point in relative configuration space. And Julian, uh, together with um, uh, Latotti, was able to show how from this and this alone you get out a unique trajectory connecting those two points, which is a dynamically allowed Newtonian trajectory for a system with total angular momentum zero. Okay. 
So I think it was a tremendous achievement. It was very unrecognized, actually, particularly in John Ehrman's marvelous book on modern up and space time. We, we saw it as somehow cheating because you're just looking at that sector of, of Newtonian mechanics, Newtonian gravity, the non total angular momentum zero sector. But it wasn't like that at all. It, it naturally was a prediction of the bubble the total angular momentum of the universe at zero. And it seems that that's correct. <clears throat> So a great achievement and very easily stable, describable in my terms, but not, of course, the best matching condition, not, of course, the simplifying moves that give you also the time interval between these relative configurations. Because that involves mathematics, and I'm not trying to put mathematics into the physics, or, <coughs> sorry, into the, into the natural language. If, if I can do a little bit of it, I, I will. Where I can, I'll do it, but I'm not looking for the set for reduction. So move on. Um, so this is uh, also was in uh, John Ehrman's book, and I don't think he spent any time on it at all. He called it Maxwell space time. Uh, so this is something I developed and raw in the context of the Principia using the mathematics available to Newton and to Huygens, because I think they had it right there, and I think it's implicit in the structure of Principia. Anyway, the relative, the, the, the invariant quantities then are relative angles and spatial directions picked out by any two particles at different times. So I've got two particles. That's a spatial direction with a straight line connecting them. Let a bit of time go by. Here's another two particles and a spatial direction <coughs> connecting them. So the angle between those two spatial directions. So that's all you need, apart from what we already have from Robert Vitotti. And now you don't get the this angular momentum zero sector. You get full, the full intended gravity. Um, and it's recently been, uh, Dave Wallace has done a recent development of it also in field theory, uh, and uh, gives rise to a new kind of cosmology, but unfortunately uh, it's not that much better than Newtonian cosmology, uh, it still needs boundary conditions to give you cosmological sense of infinite mass distributions, um, and so on. Okay, so next one, magnitude of velocity differences of a single particle at two different times, this is Galileo, um, and um, Galileo didn't have this physics in school, I'm calling it that, and I have this photograph, because it's Galilean relativity, space-time is Galilean. The space time for the previous one, by the way, this, uh, so using differential geometry, Maxwellian uh, space time, in, in the sense that I developed, um, it's uh, space, uh, vector space, space time, uh, Newton, uh, Huygens space time, because I think Huygens had it. Um, anyway, so moving on, uh, and now Newton, magnitude of velocity of particle relative to absence space at each time. So these would be the various systems of invariant predications that one could make. So, I want to thereby make um, invariant descriptions of the systems of bodies gravitating you know, as a sequence of configurations over time. It's not explanatory. It is just descriptive. To be explanatory, I think, you can maybe make limited explanations, um, but to be generally explanatory, I don't think we've got any alternative but to use the equations. You've got to actually calculate stuff. Uh, you've got to understand the equations. It's mathematical thought that's involved, and this is what is explanatory. There's rather limited explanations that you can get out just from descriptive stuff. What I'm giving, think of it this way, what I'm giving is something like the Humean mosaic, you know, David Lewis's thing. Uh, it's just a, a sort of pattern of events. You know. it's, that's all that, that this invariant predication is doing. But it's telling a story, it's telling a sequence of events, of things that actually happen. And that, in principle, goes right down to the micro world, it goes right up to cosmology. But there's no guarantee we're going to get to any absolute truth. I mean, this is, this is, sort of, this is all very parochial stuff. I mean, I'm not sure it's the, uh, the predicate calculus, magnificent as it is, is a mathematical creation. Um, it, it's really, uh, it's hardly expressively adequate to even a small part of natural language. Um, and, and there's no reason to think that in terms of it, we can articulate whatever's going on anywhere in physics. Um, it just kind of become very, very difficult. With classical field theory, you can kind of go a long way and suppose you can always talk about concatenations of field values or field values taking a certain range of values where some other field is taking a range of values. And you know, this is how we build up a solution to uh, different morphism symmetry in GR. Um, so we're familiar with that. So if you think you can define the pattern of classical fields everywhere in space time, you might think, well, this is very fundamental, isn't it? But of course, classical theory is Okay, well, when we move on to special relativity and the Kopsky space time structure, for the first time now we've got genuine metric space. It's the first time in, in physics that we have metric space. And it's with, uh, 
lunchtime. That's not how you can see them, of course. That's more costly. Um, and indeed, then we can speak about invariance, maths invariance. That goes all the way you want with typical phenomenology, with relativistic physics, things like uh, you know, contraction, time dilation, and so on and so forth. That's all defined and specifiable in invariant terms. Okay. So, um, well, let me just go back a bit and say I can speak about points in Euclidean space, and I can even do it satisfying the identity of discernibles because very interesting points, there's an answer difference between them, that's an invariant statement. I can do the same in Minkowski um, space time. So there's no problem in talking about points of space in, in these frameworks. In these you might not want to, for example, in Barbara Tosi. You might not want to in my vector space relationalism. But you can, if you wish. But what about linking points of space to material particles? How can I do that? And why would one want to do it? I mean, here's one of my favorite figures, partly because it's a wonderful figure. <laughs> I don't know what it is about scientists and philosophers. <laughs> I'm very photogenic. I look forward in my old age. Eventually, perhaps, I can I don't know, grow a shaggy moustache or something like that. Hmm. So, anyone know who this is? It's not heavy side, is it? No. Oh. Right. No, no. The great Jonli Carl Neumann, oh. who I think, in a way, is the founding father of philosophy of physics. I really do. Or at least he, in 1832, I think, died in 1925. It was his work, more than Marx, that precipitated the new interest in the foundations of mechanics and foundations of gravity. It was his work that really precipitated interest in Gibbs paradox. Uh, he, who worked also for the integral calculus in the 19th century. So, but I mean, a very formidable figure, and I think he did initiate a great deal of the really new thinking, eventually culminating in Einstein's interest in Marx's principle, and so forth. Uh, anyway, here's what he had to say uh, about absolute space. In order to get an overview of the connection between different phenomena presented simultaneously, it is often expedient to introduce a, a merely conceptual process, a merely conceptual substance that, so to speak, represents an intermediate principle, a central point from which the individual phenomena can be reached in different directions. The individual phenomena are linked to each other in this manner, in that each is related to the central point. I think that's exactly right. I think that's exactly how mathematicians think when they're working in anything like a physical based theory. Anyway. I think it's exactly what Newton was doing and why he insisted on absolute space. I think this is what really was at the core of Newton's thinking. And I think actually he delivered a construction like this, where he was able to refer to these central points and so forth in Principia, despite the fact of corollary five and the whole solar system of the motion and so on and so forth. Uh, but anyway, that takes us back to Newton, Newton studies and let me know the stuff like that. Anyway, how do I deal with them? How do I relate particles, material bodies, to points of space in an invariant way? I, I, mean, I don't think it's that difficult. I mean, you've got to ask the question um, in order to, you know, I don't know, answer that, but I you know, find it interesting, really. So here's how. <clears throat> so this is a simple sentence. R is just a relation, spatial relation between, I've got variables x and y ranging over material particles variables u, v, w, ranging over points of space time, uh, sorry, points of space. Uh, and uh, so this, this, what this is saying, I'm, I'm really thinking of a collateral triangle. Uh, and the u that is postulated to exist is the centroid. So you know, r would be a relation of a certain distance, a range, small range of distance. Uh, w would be, and it's the same r for all three, the collateral triangle. And W is the distance from each vertex of the triangle to the center of the center of mass, <coughs> if they read the masses anyway. Okay, and the point about this is that it's invariant. The truth value is invariant if you shift matter relative to space. And what's crucial, of course, is that well, it's an embedded quantifier. This is quantification here. In Quinean terms, there is ontological commitment. When I spoke earlier about to be to is the value of the bound variable. I didn't mean to disparage it in this sort of context, because we're talking about what exists, but we're just talking as physicists, you know, talk about the world, about reality. I'm just you know, making it a little bit more regimented, a little bit more precise. Uh, uh, so quant what you're quantifying over really is an ontological commitment that you're not thereby beholden to. Uh, I can put it in terms of open invariant predicates. So this is just an open complex predicate uh, in, in two-place two, two, two predicates. Uh, so, uh, 
uh, and with, the, with this quantified, crucially you have that quantified there, if it was absent, then the truth value of this thing would not be invariant as you shift the map distribution out of the space. Um, <clears throat> I probably should say a little bit about how I'm thinking of the model theory going here. I mean, the, the, the general idea is when you speak about, when you research stuff, and you say what it is, and so you speak about the world. But yeah, we do have model theory. We've got this mathematical set theory construction model theory that we use as well. So how does that work? I'm thinking that the model theory is a purely mathematical construct. It's an auxiliary aid. It may or may not be useful. Um, but it does build in all sorts of, well, I mean, I put it, hexatistic elements, you know. You, a set theoretic thing, every element of it is, is distinct and is individual and you're defining sets in terms of what the elements contain. So it's something very foreign to the physics, um, but it may be useful in this state of stuff. I, I think of uh, Gibbs, do you know the last chapter of his book, um, it's, uh, System Mechanics, where he speaks about the issue of particles that are exactly alike, indeed indistinguishable, it's the first time he uses that word, and it's the first time the word I think is used in English. He did in the 1870s use the word um, undistinguishable, interesting. Um, and it's also interesting that um, Tanson in 1911, I think, uh, who published, one, regarded as one of the first to write on indistinguishability, uh, he published in English as well as in Dutch, I think it was in Dutch. Um, was it in German? Yeah. Uh, and the word he used there was undistinguishable. Um, but what he meant by it was not what Gibbs meant by it, and I'll come back to it in a minute. Anyway, so Gibbs talking about uh, uh, indistinguishability, um, he said that if we were talking about physical systems, then um, if they're generally indistinguishable, there's, there's real issues with identity um, symbols and things like this. You know. But he said, if we we're talking about my, my uh, ensemble view to make sense of probabilities, um, these are creatures of the imagination. And as creatures of the imagination, I don't have any difficulty whatsoever in thinking of a particular atom as a member of a gas and is it the same or different as an atom in another gas in the ensemble? We said we can do that. We can do that in thought, and indeed we can do that in thought. So there's something um, which goes well beyond anything meaningful, I think, in physical terms when we set out a set theoretic model for the system of language. So here, it's rather important that the various predicates that I'm using are defined in terms of quantities. They're defined in terms of these invariant quantities. They're not defined extensionally in terms of the model theory. If they were, it would be very difficult to know, I mean, you know, the, the, which predicates are one, is one talking about when you're looking at different models. So one model would have material particles in one relationship to spatial points, uh, so that you want to think of uh, you know, a certain relation that exists between them. Another model, I'm shifting the two relative to one to the other, so now a different relation exists between the two of them. Um, but uh, th these predicates...